All right. Uh, theme over the last couple days has been um, about taking and not just using the uh, classes, the components in the framework, and using them as is, but writing our own code to do stuff. So we're going to continue with that. So let's look at where we left off last time. Last time we left off with um, logging in and displaying on the screen um, the username of the person, the name of the person that was logged in. So let's pick up there and we're going to shift to from doing strictly queries from the database to doing uh, inserts into the database. So let's take a few minutes to talk about how an insert in the database looks. All right? What it looks like before we, we move into that. All right? So let me gather my thoughts for a second, make sure I know what I want to say, and go from there. This is week 11, by the way. And your design is due soon for your project. Next week, if I'm not mistaken. November 1st. That would be next Thursday, all right? All right, yeah, because Halloween is... All right, so let's bring down the thing that we're working on. And let's talk about inserts into the database. What's an insert statement look like? How does it start? Good. I like that. Go for the low-hanging fruit, right? So now you're off the hook, the rest of the class, because you volunteered to answer first. You know? What's after the word insert? Okay. True. But specific syntax. This one's all this one's also should be an automatic. How do, what do you, how do you insert into a table? How do you insert into a table? Into. Insert into, and then the table name. So let's imagine we have a, a table called announcements. Because this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a table called announcements that looks like this. Imagine this is like, we've been doing an academic example, so we've been doing a database tables for a school and so on and so forth. So we have, uh, we're going to create a professor page that looks like this. Has on the top of the page all the information about a professor. First name, last name, and so on. We're then going to have a list of announcements that the professor has made. All right? And we're not going to go so far as to tie an announcement to a class. We're just going to tie an announcement to a professor. So the table for the announcements is going to look like this. It's related to a professor. We drew the ERD diagram. would say that one professor can have many announcements. But one announcement can only relate to one professor. So our professor table or our faculty table already has the stuff it has in here. And the key to it was faculty ID. What are going to be the columns of this table, the announcement table? Let's say here's what we want. We want the announcement, the text of the announcement, and we want the date time that the announcement was posted. So what? Would, so we can sort them. We can sort them in order from most recent to least recent. <coughs> What's the columns in that table going to look like? What's the primary key to this table going to look like? See, you're smart. You're off the hook now. I'm not going to look to you. You certainly can answer if you want, but... You can do an announcement ID. Pardon me? You can do an announcement ID. Yeah. I would put an announcement ID here. 
Simply because, if you think of it, what else could be the primary key? We could have faculty ID combined with the date time it was made, and that might work, so we could do that. Um, that would be probably our other option, but we might as well do uh, announcement ID. Again, I'm a big fan of auto number or surrogate keys, simply because they're, they're neat they're, they're neat and tidy. All right? And then I don't have to worry about, could someone post two announcements at the exact same time? Well, within a second of each other, maybe they could. I don't know. I don't know how close it keeps the time. You know, maybe it goes to milliseconds, so it would be impossible. Well, I don't have to worry about that. All right? Uh, so I'm going to make the announcement ID the primary key. What other columns am I going to have in this table? Yeah, who announced it? So that's going to relate to the faculty table, not professor table, faculty. And how do we identify who made this announcement? What do we put in that table? Uh, faculty ID. Faculty ID, right. Now again, remember our rule. We have a one-to-many relationship. The many side can point to the one side. An announcement can have the one faculty member that made that announcement. All right, that's logical. Because the many can point to the one. You know, Look at it this way. If you were to ask, if I were to ask, who is your professor in this class, you all could point to me, right? If I were to ask, who are my students, I couldn't, with one column in the database, one finger, with one column in the database, I couldn't point to everyone all at once, all right? So the one side can't point to the many. The many side can point to the one, all right? So... I can put in the announcement table a faculty ID to point to the person that made it. All right? So the other, other, time, other thing I would put would be the announcement time. And I would say the announcement message. I would say everything is required in here. All right? Um, and that's probably our announcement table. So, how would we insert into this table? Let's say the auto number ID is going to be automatically generated. So let's say faculty ID of one wants to place an announcement 10, 23, 2018 at 10.30 a.m. Wants to put a message saying uh, I'm hungry. All right? Not a good announcement, but they might say that, right? They might let their, they might let their come, upcoming class know that they're going to be crabby in class because they're hungry, all right? So, let's say that's the announcement we want, to, we want to post. What would the insert for this look like? All right, we already have that. Insert into a table. So, insert into the table. There are a couple different syntaxes for this, but we're going to go over the one that's probably most commonly used in what we're doing here. Some of the other syntaxes, one thing you can do is you can omit the column names, all right? Which isn't good, because if someone adds a column, that can mess things up. Someone adds a column to your table. The other thing you can do is you can do a query and insert from one table into another. That's useful if you're converting data. Like if you had something that was in an Excel worksheet and you need to bring it into a relational database. 
You could create a table from that access, uh, not access, um, Excel worksheet and do an insert into a relational database table. Done that a million times on jobs where people had something in a spreadsheet and they wanted a database for it. But for the most part, what we're going to do is we're going to say the columns table at a time with a single insert statement? The answer is actually no. You can in, One insert statement is to one table. Now, sometimes you have a situation where you need to insert into more than one table. Uh, a good example of that would be when you place an order. Let's say when you place an order at Amazon. When you create an order, there is an order header in other words, it's saying that Mike Zellers is placing an order, and then there's a list of items associated with it. So there's probably an order header table and an order item table. Well, you want to handle those two tables together. Still, you would do that via multiple insert statements, not one insert statement. And you'd use something called a database transaction to make sure that those things synced up so that you didn't have something in one table and, not, and nothing in the other. Anyhow, that's what a standard insert table of statement looks like. What about this? Notice in the uh, announcement message, there's a quote that goes around the message. And I put a single quote inside my message. So that's OK. That's not going to cause me any grief. But what if my message was, Quote the Raven, nevermore. That'd be kind of weird to open up Kansas and uh, can Kansas, right? Canvas and see that message, right? Posted from a teacher. But what if it said that? Is that going to cause any problems? I go to post this message and quote the Raven. Nevermore. Is that going to cause problems? You bet it will, unless someone takes care of the fact that there are quotes in that message. All right? How do hackers take advantage of something like this? Hackers actually take advantage of this. There's a specific kind of attack that hackers use that takes advantage of this flaw of careless programmers. It's called a SQL injection attack. I don't know if any of you have heard that. Let's look up the SQL injection attack. I think it's worth 
being aware of it. And we'll get to the good news in a minute here. Going to Wikipedia, which some people frown on, I know. Um, my point would be that if you're looking up a controversial subject, it's probably taken with a grain of salt, right? But if you're looking at a fairly unbiased technical subject, I mean, there's not political positions on SQL injection tax, uh, tax I don't think, anyhow. All right? So I would be pretty reliable. The other thing I would say is, Wikipedia is a good place for your first place to look up, but not your last or only. So if we just want to get a rough idea real quickly, I go to Wikipedia just like probably anyone else does. So is a code injection tick used to attack data-driven applications, all right, which is what we have, right? We're database-driven applications, in which nefarious, which is a great word, SQL statements are inserted into an entry uh, field for uh, execution. So let's see if they have an example of one. Alright, here's the following code. Select star from users where name equals the username. An innocent enough statement. But if you made the username or 1 equals 1, guess what? That statement's always true. And it will, set, it will return every single user from the statement. Or even worse, drop, drop a table. Add a statement to, to delete a table in here. Usually that is caused by, it's caused by a number of things, all right? One of them is not escaping characters like quotes. How SQL injection is possible on ASP.NET websites. First of all, the first and primary rule to this is using the parameter object, which if you notice in our example last time when we did a query, we used the parameter object, and I'll show you what I mean. All right. The parameter object, again, allows you to um, build the SQL statement in a safer way. So that's sort of the first rule of that. So what I mean in what we went over last time is this.
So let's look at our login page. If you notice in the code, we created our SQL command like this by specifying question marks for the parameter and using the parameter object. That will really that will that will go a long way in making your code safe from SQL injection attacks. The alternate way of doing it, the unsafe way to do it, and I'll put this in and I'll comment unsafe. Would be to not to bypass parameter object and just drop the values into the SQL statement. unsafe way. This way directly inserts those values into the select statement. This uses a parameter object and the parameter object has some kind of security built into it to prohibit SQL injection attack, uh, attacks. All right. Anyhow, it's a little longer than I wanted to talk about this. Uh, there is a great God, what is that? What is the name of that website? There's a great SQL injection cartoon. Yeah, yeah, okay. And what's the name of the site? XC? KCD. Hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something? In a way, did you really name your son Robert? Quote, parenthesis, semicolon, drop table, students, semicolon, dash, dash. Oh yes, little bobby tables, we call them. Well, we lost... This year's student records, I hope you're happy, and I hope you learned to sanitize your database inputs. So, I thought it was funnier than that. Are you guys just tired today? Or maybe this just isn't funny. I don't know. I thought this was pretty funny. This has a lot of good, good uh, cartoons in it. Anyhow. So, we're going to use SQL parameters as a bottom line. We're not going to just drop things into our statement. SQL parameters do something else nice for us, too. They handle all this stuff that I forget. Like, I remember, all right, strings you put in quotes. Numbers don't need quotes. Dates, I don't know, you do something different. I think you put them in pound signs. All right? But I always forget that. The nice thing is, though, 
is when we make the statement generic, because we don't always want to insert the same comment, so we're going to do this. We're going to put question marks in here. All right? We're going to put question marks in here. That also handles, based on the type of data it is, how the data needs to be formatted. So if we put in something in here, it will format it because this is a date, it will format it correctly to be a date. It will format that correctly to be a number, it will format that correctly to be a string. And it will do some sanitizing of the data to prevent SQL injection attacks. Now, notice I don't have the announcement ID in there. Why do I not have the announcement ID in there? Pardon me? You don't know what it's going to be. You don't know what it's going to be, and it's an auto number field. In other words, the database handles that for you. So I don't need to include an auto number field in that statement. It will automatically give it the next number in the list. All right? <clears throat> so that's essentially what an if statement, uh, not an if statement, an insert statement is going to look like in our code. Now, what could go wrong with an insert statement? What are all the things that could go wrong with this in insert statement? Yes? If you have like uh, two of the same type of uh, attribute properties that could cause confusion, which uh, column should go into? Like you have two numbers or two? Uh, yeah, you could, you could, for example, if I had two strings in here, if I had a title and a message, if I got those flipped, <clears throat> I could insert the message into the title, the title into the message, all right? It probably wouldn't cause anything to blow up, but it would give me a bad results, all right? Um, by bad results, I mean it would give me undesired results. Like if I added a title in here, which we might as well add. Would have, you know, We'd have to make sure that we put the parameters in, in the right order for us to get it right. But that wouldn't cause it to blow up. What would be some things that could cause this to blow up? <laughs> yeah. That's actually not such a bad answer. What happens if the database server was down for whatever reason, including someone actually literally, a disgruntled employee literally blew it up? All right? What would happen then? Remember, in our examples, our web server and database are on the same machine. That is not always the case. The web server could be a different machine than the database server. So the web server might be cranking out web pages, goes to do a database update, and that server could be down, all right, for whatever reason. That's one reason that this could fail. The database server is just dead, all right? What's another reason? Well, what if... This is supposed to be a date time, but I give it a string, like Charlie. You know, what time was this announcement made? It was made at Charlie o'clock. All right? It's going to blow up for that reason. What happens if I omit a required field? Announcement title is required, and I don't supply it. It's going to blow up, right? You can't insert something if it doesn't have all the required fields. What happens... <clears throat> if I don't have a valid value for something, table. What if I have faculty IDs 1 through 200 and I try to insert an announcement for faculty ID 900? It's going to get an error. All right? Same reason. So there's a lot of reasons why this insert statement could fail. All right? And some of them we can control, some of them we can't control, right? The database server being down, right, we can't control that, right? 
we have no way in our program to make sure that someone didn't shut down the database server in the middle of the day when they weren't supposed to. We can't, we just can't do that. Some of these things we can control. For example, we could validate to make sure that this was a date time. We could validate to make sure that the announcement message had a value in it. We could validate to make sure that the title had a value in it. We could use a drop down to ensure that this faculty ID is value, valid. All right? So we can, through our validation, catch some of these errors in advance and keep them from happening. And that ideally is the best case scenario, right? Best thing to do is not even let someone make a mistake, right? So if they go to add an announcement and there's no uh, message or there's no title or the faculty ID is invalid, we'll keep them from adding it by making them choose a valid faculty ID, making them enter an announcement message, making them enter an announcement title, all right? So we'll prevent that, those errors from happening just because of that, all right? Other things are beyond our control, all right? Like I said, the database server being down. And there's probably a bunch of other things, too, that you just can't think of off the top of our head. Those kinds of errors, we can't do anything to prevent. But what we can do is we can be there to clean up the mess after it happens, right? Ideally, you keep someone from spilling something on your rug, right? But sometimes people are going to spill stuff on your rug anyhow. Then you have to be there to clean up the mess. So that's the two strategies. Prevent where we can, while we can, where we can, and be there to clean it up if an unexpected error happens to slip through. So that's going to be our approach to this. Someone has to clean up the mess is the bottom line. It can either be us through our program, or it can be the ASP.NET framework. And the ASP.NET framework is going to clean it up, is going to handle it in a very brute force way. It's just going to give you a gigantic, ugly error message that the user has no idea what it means. So we want to be there to handle the error in case something slips through that we can't validate for. And we want to display a clearer error message, telling the user what happened in terms that they're going to understand, and telling them what to do next. All right? So let's go create this table in the database, and we'll work on a page that allows people to add announcements, allows faculty member to add announcements. Now, one thing. Uh, one thing uh, to consider. Um, do, 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 what am I thinking? Oh, adding an announcement. Should anyone be able to add an announcement for a faculty person? No, that, that would be horrible, right? <laughs> I would consider letting anyone grade stuff, all right? Because, again, I always fall behind and, you know, you guys might be able to help me catch up, right? So keep, look for an announcement at the end of the semester that maybe I need help grading. But anyhow, no, certainly not. So we want a way to have that web page that's going to display the faculty information and the announcements to prohibit people that aren't authorized to add an announcement. So we're going to go and we're going to put that code in later. All right. Right now we're going to build it so that anyone can add an announcement in. Then we'll go and we'll sort of close that loophole towards the end of the process. All right, so let's go and start this by creating the table and starting the page that allows us to do entry. I did make a slight error here. I did the logon based on 
the user table. I should have did it off the faculty table. All right. So I'm going to delete this table. And I'm going to delete that table. And we'll convert it. We'll convert the logon to do the faculty table instead. So let me put in here in the faculty table, let me put in username and password. everyone a password of password to keep this simple. Alright, then I'm going to go, once I've done that, I'm going to go into my application and select faculty ID last name from faculty where username equals question and user password equals question I'm going to concatenate on the first name and the last name to make the full name make sure this still works.
ID, first name, last name, username, and password. All that field's called password. mind showing errors because it shows that I'm not perfect. I know some of you guys probably think that I am, but I'm not. All right. But it also helps to see these errors and see what the solution is. So when it said no value not given for a given parameter, that's the weird way of saying that you got a column or table name wrong. Because if it can't find a column name, it thinks it's a parameter. All right. And if there's a parameter that doesn't get a value, then it doesn't know what to do with it, so it gives you that error. All right, so we converted that so it works. Cool. All right, I'm going to make a page, a faculty page, uh, that's going to show me in a details view everything about a faculty member, and then it's going to show, allow me to enter in an announcement. So, new file. We'll call it faculty info. Let's we'll select a master page. All right. Now, I'm going to change this guy to put a link to my new page. I'm going to change this one. I lied. Get rid of faculty ID. I'm going to put a hyperlink field. And I'm going to put it at the top of the list. What value do I want to pass on the query string? I'm going to pass a faculty ID. Right, because my faculty info page is going to pull up a specific faculty member using the faculty ID. So I'm going to pass the faculty ID. Data navigate URL, that's what the URL is going to be. I want to call faculty info. And I want to give it a Value on the query string of ID equals question mark. No, ID equals curly bracket zero curly bracket. So what does that mean? It means that when I create this link, the link is going to have a value of faculty info dot ASPX question mark ID equals. Then the curly bracket zero means I'm going to insert that first field faculty ID right there in the URL. So that second page, faculty info, is going to have on the query string the ID of the faculty member that I want. What's the text field going to be? I'll also make it. Um, I'll do something different here, and I'll make the text be
details. Just the word details. So I'm not going to pull value from a database. I'm just going to have the word details to be the text for this link. So there, there you go, details. So let's tackle the ID. You are a start page, page, start page. on details and it takes that page doesn't do anything of course all right so now we're going to go and we're going to build that page the top half of the page is going to have a details view to show me everything about the uh, faculty member the bottom of the page is going to allow me to add uh, comments or not comments but announcements for that faculty person all right so Faculty info. I'm going to go and drag over. Let's hope, sure. Let's hope this works. Go and drag over a SQL data source and a details view. Configure data source. Pick our string. Next. And it dies. Are we going to let that defeat us? Of course not. I'm just going to go and we're going to manually write the code to do that. stuff it didn't get saved so I'm going to copy the course details page because why not
to change this to say faculty. Connection string stays the same. Provider stays the same. The select command is going to say select star from faculty, where faculty ID equals question mark. Select parameter is question mark. It's coming from the query string. And the field is called on the query string ID. So this should be correct. I'm going to then go and drag over a details view. And I'm going to say the data source is SQL data source fact, uh, faculty. And there you go. missing. Well, let's see. Let's see if this works. Studio. Gasp. All right. Okay. Let's go and write the second part of this now. All right. Second part of this is to write code to do an insert. Now, we could write this a bunch of different ways. But three of our fields in the announcement table, let's see, two of the fields we don't have to enter in, right? We don't have to enter in the faculty ID uh, number, right? Because the faculty ID number is the faculty ID of the person that's logged on, right? So if I log on, it should put my faculty ID number in the announcement. It shouldn't ask me for I have a drop down and say this is an announcement for Harms or Huber, all right? It should use my, whoever's logged in, use their faculty ID. And the date and time, I shouldn't have to type that in. It should just automatically take the date and time. Okay? So, two of these things aren't going to come from our user interface. Two of these things come from elsewhere. So we're going to write uh, an insert into the announcement, and we're going to custom write it. We're not going to use the .NET framework to do that. We're going to, I mean, we're going to use the .NET framework, but we're going to write our own code to do that insert. So let's go and let's make the announcement table. I didn't want to close out of there, but that's okay. So I'm going to create a table. Go into design view, and I'm going to call it announcement. Give it a name of announcement ID primary key, faculty ID is a number, I'm announcement time is a date time, announcement title is a short text, and announcement message is also a short text. I'm going to make all of these required.
So I'm going to put on the screen, I'm going to put on the page, a couple of text boxes, and a button. I don't really care where I put the text boxes because I can I can just position them using my um, by going into the code anyhow. So we'll call this text box title, text box message and button save. And we'll change the text on this guy to save. All right, let's view the code for this. I normally put forms in unordered lists, and then we can style it. Because really, what is a form but a list of, of items that we have to enter in? You might say, I don't like the way it's going to look like as a list, bulleted and all that. Well, we can change all that via CSS, so that's not an issue. on here. This should be review from HTML class, right? Label 4. I put the, the ID of the field. to just minimally make this look a little bit better. Let's see, what do I want to do? Um, li um, ul list style type none. What's that do? Guess where the bullet points exactly. Now I'm going to say label, and I'm going to say display inline block. Inline block is sort of a magical property where it has some of the characteristics of an inline tag, some of a block tag, and I'll give it a width of, I don't know, 50 pixels, 100 pixels. And I'll give it text align right. Now if we look at this, it looks a little neater. All right, because those things are lined up over there. Um, we could probably do something with the button, but I'm 
done with this. All right. So now all we have to do is we have to write the code that actually does the insert. Now, there's some other things we should do, right? But I'm a little deliberately leaving them off for now. We should validate those fields, right? Because both of them are, um, are required fields in the database, right? And by putting validation controls, we can make sure that the user puts valid, uh, valid data in it, make sure that the user puts something in there. But we're going to skip that for now deliberately, uh, partly just because I want to get done, and partly I want to show you the consequence if we don't do it. All right? So I double-click on this. That puts me in the button save click event. All right? So this is where we're going to write our code to actually do the save into the database. All right? Now remember, when we double-click an element, it brings us to the code in the CS file, and it also attaches that code in the ASPX file. So notice now it says AS, uh, ASP button, blah, 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 on click, button save click. So that's what ties that button to the C-sharp code that does it. So if I were to go and delete that function, if I accidentally clicked on the button and I didn't want to put a function there for some reason, all right, and I deleted the function from the CS file, I'd also have to delete it here, all right, because otherwise it's going to be expecting that there's a function called button save underscore click. All right, so I'm going to go in that, and I'm going to, because I'm lazy, I'm going to copy a lot of code from the login. Because a lot of the code is the same, believe it or not. In fact, up to here, the code's going to be real similar between doing a query and doing an insert. Any SQL statement, there's going to be a lot of things in common, right? We still need to tie to our database, right? So we still need a SQL data source. So that's the same, right? We're doing an insert instead of a query, but we still need to be connected to the database to do that. So that part's going to be the same. The next part, we need to tell it what database we're connecting to, right? That's the same whether we're doing an insert or a query. All right, this isn't relevant here. We're going to define our select, our, our SQL statement, but our SQL statement is not going to be a query. It's going to be an insert. So I'm going to put in the objds insert command. All right. Now here's where I put my insert command. And as essentially what we had on the screen up there, I'm going to go to uh, Notepad and type it in so you can all see it, and then I'll, I'll cut and paste it over. Cut and paste it over. So insert into announcement. Right? That's how our insert statement looks. The list of the columns that we're inserting. We have faculty ID. We have announcement time. We have uh, announcement title. And we have announcement message. Notice it's not case sensitive, so I didn't bother capitalizing. Programmers usually have better things to do than capitalize stuff, right? So, values. What am I going to put in for the values for this? Question marks. Exactly. We don't know what the values are. The values are going to be, be, de be determined at runtime. We're going to, where are we going to get 
each of these things from? Where are we getting the faculty ID from? From the query string or from the session ID. All right. Um, I could use either one of them. All right, because they should be the same. All right. So we're going to get the faculty ID from the query string or from the session ID. The announcement time, where are we going to get that from? Just system time, right? The title, where are we getting that from? Yeah, text box. And the message we're also getting from a text box. So, we have our values, but we don't know what their exact values are. We know where we're getting them from, so we have that covered, but we don't know those values. They're going to be filled in at runtime. That's what the question mark means. All right? means that somehow these values are going to get put in. We have a place that each of these things are going to come from, and when the program actually runs, that's where the actual values get popped in here. So this is what my insert statement looks like. I can test this. All right. How can I test this? Well, I could go into access and I could create a query and I could paste it in and I could say run it. Oh, I'm in I have to enable the content. It's asking me for values. So the first one I'm going to say faculty ID 1, about to append a row. All right. It gave me an error. But I don't think it gave me a bad error. Because I think it didn't know what to do with all those question marks. So it asked me for one of them. All right. Um, ASP.NET's not going to have that problem. So I think this test showed me that the rest of the code was OK. We'll find out, won't we? All right. So I'm going to paste that in. string ID. Let's parse this. All right. Request is data that comes into the web page. Remember, there's two big objects in any sort of client server programming. There's a request and a response. So the request is what comes from the client to the server. Well, the query string is part of that request that comes from the client to the server. 
So the query string is part of the request. In parentheses, not in parentheses, but in square brackets is the name of the field on the query string, and that's ID. I'm going to go a little bit longer today on lecture. It's, it's bonus. This is bonus material. All right. If this was a DVD, I would have cut off at 11.30 and then released the, the, the next 10 minutes of class as special bonus material director's cut. All right. So that's where I'm getting the value of the ID from. Where am I getting the value of the time? I don't remember how to look up the time in C sharp. So I'm going to Google it. How do you get the current time of the day? And of course, we're going to find 50 different ways of doing it. And 100 different people arguing about what the best way is. This one looks good enough for me. two things come from our text boxes. So announcement title comes from our text box title. set up and ready to go. Remember, this is just forming the SQL statement. Just like when we logged on, we had all this stuff to sort of initialize the SQL statement. Now we have to go and make it happen. Here's where an insert, update, and delete is actually easier than a select, right? Because a select returns a list of rows that it selects. An insert statement either works or it doesn't. That's it. All right? So, I don't have to set up the classes to get the return values and get the data that, that, the, that the query returns and loop through them and do all kinds of stuff like that. This insert statement is either going to work or not. All right? So all I have to say is insert. All right? Okay, so here's the test. We have to make sure that it works. All right. So, Well, 
that means that one of my column names isn't correct. Do you have? I think uh, you said uh, for the text boxes, just use the properties or dot text. Oh, dot text. That's what I intended to do. My bad. You're absolutely right. You let me make the mistake, though. And then, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. So let's stop. Now let's try this again. Take two. That will end up on the blooper reel for this video, okay? All right. Same thing. All right, we have to look to find out what is wrong with this. Probably one of these column names is wrong. Faculty ID. How am I going to find out what's wrong here? Well, could look closer at the database. Announcement ID, announcement, time, title, and message. Oh, what does this say? It says select parameter. What do you suspect it should say instead? insert parameter. I made this exact error last semester. All right. And you know what? Last time it took me eight minutes to figure it out. This time it took me four minutes to figure out. When I make this mistake in the spring, it'll take me two minutes to figure out. All right. Hopefully I'll reach that point where I cross over where I don't make this mistake anymore. But at the very least, when you've made a mistake often enough, you recognize it quicker. So in other words, it didn't have, nothing had parameters because I was putting them in the wrong place. So we'll change all these to insert, and this will work, or I will give up and fix it and post it later. That's a good sign. No, it isn't. Oh, it's open exclusively. Duh. You can't be editing a table. and trying to insert into it.
that's a good sign because it didn't blow up. All right? Now, this is clearly not done, right? Because we would want something to happen. Because if I was running this app, I'd look and say, it didn't add my announcement. And guess what? I just added it every time I pressed a button. So now if we look at the announcement table, it got inserted multiple times. All right? Because I hit save. So we need to figure out how to handle that. We also need to figure out how to handle this. What if I don't enter anything for the message? It blows up. All right? And we don't want it blowing up this way. We want to handle it ourselves. Now, this is a preventable error, right? All we have to do is put a validator control on that. But, as I mentioned before, there's some errors that we can't prevent, all right, which means we have to be there to clean up the mess and display a user-friendly message. For example, if the database server was down. Or like we saw a minute ago, I was ex that, that table was exclusively open, all right. Some DBA could be doing administration on a database and someone goes and tries to add something. Should tell them a likely cause for the problem and what they can do to fix it. We'll address those issues next time. All right. Uh, I will go unlock lab. I'll come back here to grab my files, and then I'll be back over at lab.